Now, unfortunately, in the many years that I've been involved in property, I can actually count on an amputated hand how many others are genuinely trying to help and educate others to invest in a way that's achievable, sustainable, and comfortable to you and your sleep at night factor. But lucky for you, today's one of them, as we're joined by a fellow property investment educator and enabler, PK Gupta. For those of you who don't know him, PK is a proud father, husband, and active property investor with a portfolio of both residential and commercial property, as well as development projects that now affords him a six-figure passive income. And PK and I share the same mission to share knowledge on building passive income through property investing done properly. Through his Oz Property Mastery podcast, his YouTube videos, and his Property Investment Accelerator course, PK helps you to learn free strategies and market insights backed by his data-led system and his wealth of experience. He gives you essential tactics to help you buy the top 5% growth in high cash flow properties and grow your prop portfolio without wasting months doing research, without spending all of your weekends sitting in the car driving around looking at inspections or spending thousands on buyer's agents. And we're both on the same page in relation to helping you to remove financial stress so that you can do more of the things that you love with the people you love. So I'm really excited about deep diving and all things property. So welcome and let's get invested, Pika. Thanks so much, Bushy. I'm, I'm also excited and a little bit nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous, mate. Uh, you and I have had a, a couple of chats already and yeah. uh, I, I just love the way you uh, share information freely in a genuine way that's, that's there to help others. And, and a lot of that will come out of our discussion today. But mate, uh, where I always like to kick off uh, is... For those who don't know who you are, can you start off by telling us what you do differently and, as importantly, why you do what you do, PK? Such a good question. Um, what I do differently than, and I assume we're talking in the property context, is, you know, generally speaking, everyone is trying to sell you something, like sort of, I don't know, they're, they're trying to make a quick buck and it's masked in a lot of things that make sense. The wrapper and the ribbon and the card on the present looks amazing. But when you open it up, it's like, oh, there's a box inside there. There's another box. And the actual present's just like tiny little thing. It's not really substantial. So what I, I do different is I actually just give the contents of the box first. And I let the people wrap it themselves. And what I mean by that is I'm so big on education. I know you are bushy as well with this podcast and other places as well. But yeah, I don't know if it can be my claim to fame, but there's literally more than 600 videos on YouTube, hundreds of podcast episodes of a community on Facebook with over 30,000 people. I just love educating. And if people vibe with me, then I help because they've already know, they already learn so much for free. So that's kind of like my point of difference and why I do what I do. I mean, we could write a novel in this and I don't profess to be like someone that you should look up to or anything like that. But property for me has changed my life. It's um, I can talk about it emotionally if you want me to, but it literally has changed the the course of um, the life of my myself and my wife. And like my son, he's four years old. The opportunities that he's going to have in life because of what property has done for us are the opportunities that I never had when I was four years old. Okay. So like for me, I'm always so grateful to property and as corny as it cheesy as it sounds. And of course, you know, nothing is a charity. So it's like, okay, why well, not just give everything for free? Nothing's a charity, but I try to do my bit in terms of just giving so much free education so that people can do it themselves. Okay. By themselves for themselves. And if they need help, they can reach out, but absolutely. I love it when people do it for themselves, by themselves, even without my formal help. Yeah, I love it. Love it. And, and that's such a, a great way to get the message out there because uh, it's going to be sustainable. And I, I will circle back on the uh, emotional uh, part of how properties helped you because I think that will be uh, really important to share. And, and as part of that, I guess, uh, PK, what I'd love you to do is take us on a bit of a, a, a run through your journey to date and focus on what you've invested your time, your energy, and your money in over the years and why. And how's this led you to where you are and what you're doing now? Sure. Pro probably 
I don't know if it's uh, sensible to to start in high school, but I'll just briefly start there because I am a second generation immigrant. Well, actually, I was born in India, um, but we moved um, to New Zealand when I was four. So it's kind of in the middle. Um, we didn't have a lot, um, you know, growing up. And the reason is that, you know, when people migrate from overseas, especially in the 90s, you're not actually allowed to bring much money into the country that you're migrating to. So even though you might be really qualified in your country of origin, you have to start life fresh. And for me, it was literally like nothing. You know, my my mom was a machinist. She sewed curtains. And, you know, my dad also, he was a, an engineer and he had to re-engineer his career just to get by in New Zealand where we uh, grew up. I remember in high school, because I didn't want to live the life again that I had during primary school, I started Googling when everyone else was like, um, going out and playing touch football or you know, whatever it is. I was Googling, you know, best salary jobs. Because for me, it was always in the mind that I have to get ahead. To to get money means to be happy. That At least at that time, that was my con concept. That was my philosophy. And so yeah. what came up was investment banking. What came up was investment banking, not doctors, not dentists, not accountants, but investment bankers. Google told me when I was 13, got you a six-figure salary straight out of university. So I was like, well, that's my ticket, right? I'm good at math. I, I can do this. That was my ticket. And I literally, Moshe, I, I kid you not, I busted my ass um, throughout high school. Oh, I just played sport and everything as well. But my focus was so clinical. I must become an investment banker. It was a very vain thing in hindsight. And I did, you know, went to UQ in Brisbane and did my finance degree and everything. And I just got my first job at JP Morgan trading sto stocks in the oil and gas sector, doing equities research. And yeah, I was making good money unapologetically, you know, six figures out of university, the exact goal that I had when I was 13. But, and the reason I say all of this is that, like, it just did not fulfill the expectations that I had from it. Um, it paid well, but my life was really miserable because we're working 90 hour weeks. And like, yes, I could buy anything and I it could flaunt my ego because I was able to afford things that my friends and family couldn't. But honestly, I had no time to even utilize that. And so then I was like, okay, well, this isn't it. This isn't it. Like, this was a massive fake out. Um, what's next? And I was like, okay, well, I know how to trade stocks. Why don't I just try to achieve financial independence through the whole equities, you know, through the money market, through the commodity markets, through stock investing. And I very, very quickly realized that to get anywhere in the stock market, you need to have a big lump sum to start. Because let's be honest, if I have 20 grand in the bank and I make even 50% on it, which is like highly unrepeatable, but that's only $10,000, <laughs> right? So if you do that for like 30, 40, 50 years, the whole Warren Buffett way, of course, you know, it's it's a no brainer, but I don't want to wait 40 years. I don't want to wait 50 years. I wanted to like leave the nine to five, so, so to speak quickly. And so like what works in Australia, apparently property, right? That That was what everyone told me. That's what I was reading on the news. That's what you know, it was on TV, all these property people, everyday people. And I was like, this is, this is, this doesn't sound right. <laughs> this is like, if it was that easy, then how come everyone's not driving around in a Lamborghini and stuff? So I did all the seminars and stuff, Bushy, you know, where they get you to the back of the room and try to flog you a, an amazing deal for a limited time and all that. And they were talking about things like, oh, you have to buy close to a CBD and that's where the best growth is. You need to be, you know, in blue chip areas. You need to utilize negative gearing. You need to be close to the ocean. You, all of these myths. And I was like, okay, this, this appears to be good, but let me not just outsource the thinking to someone else, but let me think about it objectively myself. And because I had a statistical background, I was working in banking, I actually got 20, 30 years of property data and I regressed it to, you know, what has growth in these suburbs actually done? And wow. you very quickly find that Sydney performs no better than a place like Launceston over 30 years. You quickly find out that a place like Vaucluse, you know, premium suburbs, uh, perform no better than like a Parramatta, like a house, like a land, landed house in Parramatta over 30 years. You find out that proximity to the ocean, that a tr even things like train stations don't actually have any statistical correlation with growth. So I was like that guy or that gal on the stage in that fancy hotel with the suit, you know, and the Mercedes and the PowerPoint projector. I was like, 
they're actually not telling the truth, right? That was the aha moment for me. And I was like, um, I can't trust anyone. I can't trust I can't trust people like myself in 2023, right? Like I can't trust anyone who's trying to sell me anything. But what I can trust is that property is the vehicle to, for me to achieve um, my exit from nine to five. Yeah. I've seen people do it. Let, let, let me drill right in there then, because what I'm hearing is you are clearly having some reservations around uh, the, the, the sort of myths that are being perpetrated by the industry. Uh, and you've done the data research, uh, which is starting to say, well, all of these areas that everyone raves about aren't all that flash. Uh, what what helped you overcome those probably initial concerns to to continue on that property journey? Because a lot of people would have gone, ah, this is all bollocks. Uh, I'll I'll give this away and do something else. Well, like unfortunately, um, I don't think there was so many podcasts, or I don't think YouTube was a big thing back then. Like there was no role models. Like I don't know about you back then, Bushy. Like there was no one in in the kind of media that was that you could look up to. Um, necessarily who was objective without them trying to sell you something. So what really inspired me to keep going and, and actually do it was actually just action. Um, so, you know, it's not like I went out and had this idea of 10 properties in 10 years or whatever thing that people say these days, but I was like, let me just at least buy one and, and let me be reasonable about it. So I bought one um, in New South Wales um, and, and that was from Sydney. I was living in Sydney at the time. And I was like, that was an East Gosford. And I was thinking like, let me not go down the negative geared path. Let me buy something that's positively geared. Um, let me use my own data insights that I gained myself. And let's see if it works. Like if it doesn't work, you know, for a 300K property, all right, like I've just wasted a deposit of $40,000. Okay. And it's not going to like crash or anything. So, and it worked. And so that was my biggest driver. It actually worked. Well, let's let's define what work means because what works is means different things to different people. What what was your initial uh, investment strategy in property at that time? And 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 when you say it worked, what does work mean? So my my strategy was that I really <laughs> this is so embarrassing, and you're going to hate me for it because I know that you espouse the opposite. I honestly don't have a strategy, Bushy. I'm sorry to say, uh, like that was probably a mistake, a huge mistake. Like I said just before, it was just this concept of let me just see if this first one works or not, this first property. And so what does worked mean? It paid for itself. Okay. So like before jumping in and buying an asset worth three hundred thousand um, dollars, I think it was three twenty thousand, it was like, okay, I want it to pay for itself. I don't want to buy a property or let's say a, a property business, which is what it is really, that I have to contribute every year. So it was it was self-sustaining so i was like okay from a cash flow perspective if i lose my high pressure job i don't have to sell that thing and it was valued like when i bought it i got it for 320 and like just within a few months this isn't amazing numbers right but it was valued at 340 so i was like oh that's twenty thousand dollars gain in um three months i was like all right that's going up but then it's like you know for you or for people who are listening that they're probably like well that's kind of negligible growth but 20 grand on a deposit of about 30 to 40 is like a 50% return on investment in three months. And I compare that to what we were achieving for clients at JP Morgan. And it was, I mean, it was nowhere near. It's like, if you can get four or 5%, you know, it's on a stock, it's like, you, you've done well. So I was like, this, this is some on a cash on cash basis. This is taking care of itself and it's going up in value. That's what yep, worked. Right. Brilliant. Great. So it's not costing you anything. It's looking after itself. And, and you know, you probably heard me say before that I believe property uh, is a long-term journey. So for 30 grand down and, and using the, the bank to fund the rest, you, you're getting an uplift of 20 grand in a matter of months. That, that's a sensational result. So I can I can see why you'd be going, well, this, is, this sounds awesome. Where, where did that lead you to then? So uh, that property starting to perform well. Uh, what happened from there? So then I got, ex I started to get excited, right? Because it kind of catch the property bug. Like in anything in life, when you're sort of onto something, even if it's like when you start playing tennis and your your forehands start consistently going in, you feel rejuvenated. You feel a little bit exhilarated. By the way, mine don't consistently go in. But um, <laughs> it was like, there's properties, there's something in this whole property thing. 
Um, and so then I, we moved back to, to Brisbane. Um, I got a different job, something a little bit less high pressure. And I continued. So I was like, this formula worked. I tried to refine it a little bit. So I added more data factors that I was looking at. And it pointed me towards the suburb, infamous suburb in, in Melbourne or greater Melbourne called Frankston. Um, and this was in 2012, right? And so what was next was like, okay, I had never like been to Frankston, but by calling local property managers, much I had, like I'd done for in Gosford, they did all the inspections for me. They told me the best and worst parts of Frankston. Maybe it's good that I didn't go to Frankston at the time because maybe I wouldn't have invested. But once again, I bought for 315. It was valued at 340 after a few months. So um, on a cash on cash basis, like that's pretty good. The rent was 310. So it was kind of paying for itself. So I was like, oh, damn, like this is, yeah, now, now we're starting to repeat this, right? And I, then all of a sudden, I was starting to form a strategy. I was like, how many of these can I buy? Then how long do I have to wait for them to like marinate in their equity, go up? And then in the future, I can sell some and live off the rest, of course borrowing was much easier back then let's be honest it's um it's yeah. not quite like that anymore but that was where the strategy started to form in my mind yeah i love it so you, where did that lead you to and and what i'd love for you to share with us as you continue on this journey is uh, how your uh, strategy started to evolve and change as you as your knowledge increased and your experience increased and and what were some of the the highs and lows that the experience? Because as we all know, it's the particularly the challenges that that we get the most learnings out of. Can you take us through some of that? Yeah, for sure. So I I did one more property before I started to have some failure. The the next one was Kingston in Tassie, same sort of numbers, same sort of result. And then I started to get a bit of a big head. Started to tell lots of family and friends about it. You know, like puff up my chest. And then I remember at that time, now we're talking like 2015, so I'd had three properties by then. And there was now like Sydney was in the middle of a boom and like there was lots of buyers agents popping up from left, right, center. And everyone was talking about Cairns and how there was this big Hong Kong magnate that was buying a casino in Cairns and about how it was going to boom, big infrastructure, um, I think, you know, like agriculture economy was booming. There was like literally billions of infrastructure spend CapEx going on in Cairns. And I was like, you know what? Like these experts know way more than me. Um, I've done well, but, you know, I, like credit to where credit is due. I got to listen to these experts. I bought a property in Cairns. And that was the single biggest mistake of my buy and hold career because like it literally, I, what did I buy it for? I think I bought it for around 400000 and save and accept the last two years, like a COVID-induced boom, you could say, in Cairns, it was it was literally flat. And it was costing me not so much, maybe like $1,000, $2,000 a year. So I was, you know, my, that was the biggest failure. And of course, it didn't, get, didn't send me bankrupt or anything like that. But for me, the, the learning or the failure is always uh, two things. Uh, from a practical perspective, always rely on data, like microeconomic data, to the LGA that you're focused on, to the suburb that you're focused on, more so than emotive, um, you know, news article stories about big capex spend, about big, you know, like the headline, the cans to boom, this and that. Just, just kind of like forget all of that and focus on the data. That that's the mistake I did. I I forgot about how I had made money um, to date. And I, I just kind of got carried away. I made a long-term decision based on a short-term emotion. And yeah, that's probably not the best way to live life. And the second challenge or learning for myself, because um, I still plenty to learn, I still have plenty to learn, is more from a psychological perspective, you know, like no one really cares about your money as much as you do. So even though at that time, podcasts were becoming really um like yeah, really famous like property podcasts what I almost did was listen to hundreds of them and see what the intersect was of what most experts were talking about I'm like okay on the outliers experts might be wrong but everyone's talking about this everyone's talking about that therefore I must invest that way and I must invest there and honestly they no one they don't even know that I made a mistake right they don't care about me as much as I care about myself and I, I can honestly say that as well. Like, even though I produce YouTube videos, 
to my audience, the audience cares about themselves more than even I care about them. That that is the kind of principle um, that I learned from from that fairly fairly big blunder. The opportunity cost of that was immense because I could have invested somewhere like in Sydney and rode the next two years of the boom. Interesting. So yeah, that, that's really good. So your knowledge is increasing, your ego is starting to deflate a little bit, which is often <laughs> blinds us uh, to what's really going on. You're starting to ignore the, the politics, uh, as I, I, property politics, because there's a lot of puffery that goes on around what's going to happen, but until it's actually committed, doesn't mean a thing. Uh, where where was your vision starting to head then in relation to your ongoing strategy? Can you take us take us from there? I kind of <clears throat> I kind of got to the conclusion from that point, uh, Bushy, that even though I had a lofty goal, um, you know, to retire by an X number of years on X income, as as we all do, um, that it's not that I will rise to the level of my goals. Goals are important. Goals are potent, especially if you write them down. But I wasn't automatically going to rise to the level of my goals, but rather I was going to fall to the level of the systems that I had around myself. And so <clears throat> it's it's great to kind of go and, and dream, but I mean, a dream is just a dream unless you have a system to get there. So I kind of fell back, for, for want of a better word, um, to the systems that got me my first three properties that were still doing well. And I just refined that f- further and further now with, a, I suppose, like you put it, more of a modest or humble outlook because I'd, I'd failed, right? Like it wasn't a foolproof thing in property investing. It's definitely not. And so my my next steps were to just rinse and repeat that. And then I kind of thought, let me get into development a little bit. You know, can I speed this up? You know, do I really want to wait 20 years um, before I... Uh, stop working. You know, I was a little bit greedy in that sense, I guess. Can development fast track that? And so I got into a little bit of development. It it made money, but once again, like let's let's be honest, development wasn't the pot at the end of the rainbow either. And and I'll, I'll very quickly take you through some numbers. So like we did a project in Cooperu in in Brisbane. It was a corner block um, with two sorry with a a granny flat at the back old house um we renovated the house subdivided it lifted the granny flat chucked it away or we sold it actually for fifty thousand, and built two townhouses at the back you know when when a property expert comes on and tells you about a project like that everyone's just like salivating they're like oh man that there must have been like so much money in that like you know you're so intelligent this and that but honestly that that ran over by more than a year um, than what it should. It cost more than a hundred thousand dollars, more than what we'd expected. We made about two to three hundred thousand dollars, but it took three years. So yeah. you know, on the face of it, it's like, oh, man, are you did development? You know, you, you're accelerating your property journey, but it was like mm, it was a lot of effort, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of headache. For yeah, it was. I mean, it was profitable, but was it really worth it? I'd I'd probably say just. You know what I mean. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're saying. The, the allure of the uh, and the mystique and the prestige around uh, I'm a property developer sounds really good, but uh, you know when when you run the numbers and those holding costs that you talked about, and then if there's any overruns there, and then then the tax man coming in to to chunk into the capital gains exercise over a short period of time is a bit of a for many an unforeseen exercise. So what, what did you take away from from that first property development experience? And did you continue with that? Or where did that lead you to? Yeah, I was involved in a couple of more <clears throat> after that. But it wasn't, I changed my mindset to um, away from that is the panacea um, to fast tracking my way to retirement to that's another ingredient in the recipe to getting to my goal of, of retiring early. You know, it's it's almost like we're almost we're always looking for that perfect strategy, that perfect um, tactic, or that perfect project or perfect. Pro- it doesn't exist. Like <laughs> nothing can replace hard work. You know, nothing can replace. And that was kind of my aha moment, my realization again. So I was like, okay, we can do a few projects on the side, but let's stick to the bread and butter. There's no get rich quick. I'm not going to leave my nine to five as much as I'd love to, you know, you know, anytime soon. I just, I just got to, you know, build the wall. I got to build the bricks. I got to build the foundation. I got to just build this up slowly and steadily. And, and honestly, like that's, 
that's the truth. I'd love to say, you know, I had, I figured out this amazing method of like this and that, and you should follow me and like, I'll get, it didn't exist. <laughs> right? It was like, it was a lot of, um, it was a, yeah, it was a lot of naivety. It was a lot of vanity. And in hindsight, um, I'm glad I went down it, but property investing takes time, takes effort. It's worth it, but not, there's no short-term results. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I, I, I think, and this just un, doesn't revolve around property, but I think we now live in a world of total impatience. That's, that's, I mean, we live on our iPhones, so we've got instant everything. And the downside of that is that rather than embrace time as our friend and then let, allow time to do its work, we're in such a gut-busting hurry to make it happen yesterday that we we don't see the wood for the trees. And if we just just embrace it as a friend, and then do the right things and then get out of the way and let time do its work, then we're actually going to enjoy the journey much better because we're, our expectations are set around a, a, a bigger result at a, at a point of time. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? I think the journey is, you know, I don't want to come across as like boastful or anything, but now that I've been on the other side of the fence, I can tell you the grass is not greener. Like the I've, I've asked, uh, surmounted the fence i've climbed over the fence and the neighbor's grass is not any greener i'm no long no happier than what i was before so i think the the point is the journey like the journey is what's important i'll just i'll tell you a really quick story that i i heard recently i don't know if it's like totally relevant but it, it kind of sticks in my mind and it sort of goes that there was this prince who was going to become king um this was in the east somewhere um, I don't know if it's a true story, maybe, but uh, this this prince was going to become king. And in order to become king, first of all, he had to go to his guru or to his teacher um, to learn a thing or two so that, you know, he'd be seen to be fit to rule the kingdom. And so the, the teacher said to this prince, this young prince, he said, go to the jungle, go to the forest and just sit there and tell me what you hear. Okay, tell me what you hear. And so he went to this forest and he stayed there for like three, four hours. And he he sort of, okay. And he came back to his his teacher and he said, you know, I, I heard some birds. I heard like some animals kind of ruffling around. Um, you know, there was like an owl at night that I kind of heard the the voice of, um, that kind of thing. And the, the teacher just looked at him and, and said, no, no, not not at all. Go back to the forest to the jungle and this time don't come back until you tell me what you really hear okay so don't come back until you can resolve this so the prince was like okay let me go back to the forest and he sat there and he sat there and he sat there and nothing was coming to me we could just hear the same old you know like rufflings and rustlings of the jungle environment and he was like, well, I can't go back and I'm getting really, really hungry and like, you know, hangry or whatever. I, I, I got to resolve this. So then he really went into a more meditative state. He really started to um, soak himself in, in the atmosphere. And he all of a sudden he could he kind of tapped into this space where he could um, almost hear the sun warm the earth. He could almost hear like the grass drink up the mountain dew. He could like the finer, the more subtle things like the flowers opening in bloom. And so when he came back to his teacher, the teacher asked, what did you hear this time? And he said these more subtle, these more refined things like who can hear the sun warming the earth? But that's what he was hearing. And this, and the king said, yes, like now you are the teacher said, yes, now you are ready to be king. Is because now you can appreciate the journey, you can appreciate the empathy required to love others and to love yourself. And so I don't know if that's like a completely like parallel story or relevant, but for me, my realization was that if we're not meditative or introspective or just present in the journey of wealth creation, if we're always living in the future for when we achieve that outcome, when we get to the future, we won't be in the present to enjoy it. We'll still be in the future trying to achieve something else. And so we'll never be at a point in which we're actually enjoying, right? And so that was my, that's kind of been a, a big takeaway um, for me anyway. <laughs> 
Uh, it's great. I love that story, and, and I'd, I'd, you tell it tell it very well, by the way, uh, PK. That's uh, there's a really there's a bunch of messages in what you've just shared with us uh, right there, and and it's a, it's one that is very relevant to what we're talking about because uh, we're we're all in in such an impatient hurry to to get to somewhere that we're we're missing everything on the on the way through. And, and that that patience and being able to really listen and really allow time to do its work is 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 a really big miss. That that delayed gratification aspect has has been pretty much wiped out of most people's memory banks to a fair degree. And for those who uh, realise it, accept it, and then run with it and go with the flow of that, uh, life's enjoyable at, at all stages of the exercise. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, mate, so just while we're talking about it, uh, you, you mentioned that you climbed the fence. Uh, I'd love to, for you to share, you know, what, what what was the fence for you in terms of, you know, at what point uh, did you go, right, I'm now financially free? And uh, how did your thinking uh, and outlook change at that, that point in time? Can you share that with us? Sure, 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 sure. Let me try my best. Um, so it was kind of at a point where we had reached $120,000 of passive income. Um, like I said to you at the start, we didn't really have like a strategy when I first started, but you know, we're, we're pretty modest people. Uh, and so like 120 was enough. And, and I should also say like, we got there in around 10 years time. And the reason we got there is we were in high income. So it's not like anyone and everyone can just take my story and be like, I can replicate it. We were very, very grateful, very, very fortunate. And we worked very hard. My my wife was a chartered accountant at KPMG. I worked at, you know, JP Morgan Investment Banking Management Consulting and, um, and at Virgin as well as the head of strategy. So it's because of that high serviceability that we got to our outcome so soon. Like that's a really important point to make so that people don't misunderstand. But that yep. was the the fence. It was that 120K and, and that, you know, when we got there, it was like, like a big, like sigh, like, you know, now, even if I lose my job, because it's always kind of at the back of our, you know, these days, especially is frictional unemployment so much. Um, yep. Now, I, even if I, don't earn a single more dollar active income in my life, at least I can get by. Yes, inflation will mean that I probably need more in the future, but I can get by. And, and that was just a relief. You know, it wasn't about a car. It wasn't about a big house. It wasn't because we don't have any of that. Let's be honest. It was yeah, just yeah. about steady income. Like that, that was all it was about. And my mindset, you know, having reached that, which was just a lofty goal at the start, having reached that really opened my mind to what was possible and so there's this quote i don't know who whose quote this is but it goes that um millionaires don't believe in magic but billionaires do all right and i, I don't think you're meant to take it literally but the whole point is that when you reach you, you make a billion dollars you're like bushy anything is possible like if i can make a billion dollars like anything damn thing is possible in this world and obviously we were just on 120k passive, not like billions or anything, but it was that similar mindset. It was like, I was telling my wife, I was like, you know, like, actually we can do anything. Like, it's not that we have a million dollars in the bank or in the war chest to do anything, but with just a mindset, if we really put our effort and our mind and, and talent and skills, we can actually achieve more than what we thought we, we, we can achieve. And, and that's probably something that I'm still working on. It's not like that mindset is just permanently fixed in my head and and I'm just this amazing motivated person. I'm constantly like having to remind myself of it. But that's a really good lesson that for for people who are kind of watching or listening and are like, I don't know if I can achieve my my property goals. Like you can. Like you really can as long as they're realistic and as long as you give yourself enough time. I love that. And, I, and what I also love about what you've just shared is, you know, the, the question that I think people need to ask themselves is, is how much is enough for you to live the way you want to live? And for most people, 120 grand a year uh, without without any pressure and more importantly, having the time then to put into things that are really going to give you fulfilment, uh, that's a great place to be, mate. There's a sense of uh, I don't know about you, but the, the, you mentioned the word relief. The, the just the sense of uh, being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it without having to do it 
that your whole outlook on life changes. And and what what I'd love for you to to share now is a, a bridge into that because as a, as I talked about earlier in the the intro, for for me, true fulfillment comes from giving freely to others. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, talking to you and the podcast and all the work I do, I, I get immense satisfaction faction out of out of doing that what what tipped you into the education space so you, you've you've got yourself in a position where your income needs are being met you'd be able to spend time with your great wife and your family which is again a lot of people miss out on that because they're so hell-bent on chasing the dollar that that's gone before they even know it uh, what what sort of got you thinking well perhaps i need to start sharing this and opening people's eyes and ears to the opportunity that that property has, has given me yeah um for me, it was like almost like a sense of gratitude. It's kind of weird to say because property isn't a sentient being, but like a, grat- a sense of gratefulness to Australian property. So I was like, this has genuinely become my passion because how can it not? You know, if, if you if you get to your goal and you ch- it gives you that sense of relief, it becomes your passion whether you like it or not. And so I was like, but how can I best help people? And like I said at the start, like I'm not some sort of, um saint or anything like that but I was like when I first started there was so much so many people out there to just empty my pockets and I I saw through them using I mean I was lucky I, I kind of did the data analysis and I saw through it and I sort of came to this realization and then I've been kind of marinating in it in my mind lately as well is in the world 10% of people think 20% of people think they think and then the balance, 70% of people rather die than think, right? So I was like, you know, these 70% of people, they rather die. that They're not really property investors. Like they're not kind of built for maybe this game. But it's the 20% of people who are like innocent. They're thinking they're thinking because they're trying to follow the experts, quote unquote. They're trying to read these books. They're trying to consume this content. They're thinking they're doing the right thing, but actually they're just re- they're consuming recycled garbage because a lot of these professionals, quote unquote, they themselves haven't achieved what they're professing. They uh, haven't tested their theories. They're just trying to sell you like a course or a program or a buyer's agency service or some, you know, flash off the plan apartment, house land package. So my kind of passion became to help people who I was when I started, those, that 20%. The people who know how to think, like they're all good. Like they don't need me, right? They don't need anyone. They already know how to think. They already know how to see the forest from the trees. Uh, like, like you know, for example, yourself, we were talking about that before we hit record. Um, but those 20% of people, unfortunately, they're the ones that get taken for a ride. They're the ones who their dreams are elevated to uh, unrealistic proportions and then the reality isn't you know quite that and they they just get disappointed because of spruikers and this and that um, and even well well-meaning um, property professionals who aren't really out there to hurt anyone but they just I don't I really don't want to come across as arrogant but they're just not competent at what they're doing right and so it's this concept of teaching those who think they're thinking but actually are just following sheep. Yeah, really good point there, and it's. Uh, I think the, as you say, the, the disappointing outcome of a lot of that. If they've had a bad experience, it's like wash their hands, walk away, never do it again, and miss out on the immense opportunity that property is going to give them if they just stay the course, learn from it, dust themselves off, and go right. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. Let, let's keep refining this. It's a bit like learning to walk. You know, if we if we gave up the first time we tried to stand up and and decided to stay in nappies and crawl for the rest of our lives, it's it, it's no different when we put it in the property context. But there are so many who have a bad experience early that joined us to the point where we're going, well, that's it, I'm out. Uh, I, I love that you're now uh, sharing information that's going to enable those people to go, okay, well, this isn't working, but there's a reason this is not working. Now I understand why that is. Now I can correct my action and do it differently going forward and still uh, achieve uh, the, the the goals that they have uh, longer term. So love that. But before we sort of dive in full depth into uh, more of what you do, I'd love for you to share, and this doesn't have to be a, a property exercise, but what's been your biggest challenge in life so far and, and uh, what what learnings and changes have come out of that? 
Uh, it's a really easy one to answer. And the biggest challenge or um, thing that I have struggled with or I still st struggle with is expectations. I have this kind of formula that I'm trying to um, brand in my in my head and it, it goes that happiness is reality minus expectation. Happiness is reality minus expectation. And whether it's in the property space or just wealth space or um, relationships or, you know, objects of the sense. So like, I'll give you an example. Like, um, you know, I, I I love cars. Like, I'm not like a, I don't like expensive cars necessarily, but I, I like cars that feel good, that, that drive well. Like, I'm a big Italian car guy. Um, <laughs> right? So, like, you know, like Alfa Romeos, etc. cetera. Um, so, when I got my first Alfa Romeo, you know, when well, I was kind of saved so much up to to get it, and I built this whole thing up in my mind, I'm, I'm going to be so happy when I get it. And when I got it, it was like, I was happy for a while. But then that amazing car for me, it was a Giulietta, wasn't it terribly expensive, a 2013 Giulietta, that happiness didn't last very long. And so for me, it was like, what happiness truly was, was the idea of being happy when I got that car rather than the actual relationship between that matter, that car and myself over the long term. And so I, I thought that was like a massive fake out. And so it was like, happiness is actually just reality minus expectation. I still love alphas, but the whole concept is don't live your life, you know, like grinding and hustling just to achieve a material object because when you get there, and I've got there in so many instances, that happiness, that joy, that satisfaction is so fleeting, <laughs> it's it's almost not even worth it. Um, what's more important, like we've already discussed, is the journey to to getting there. And then the kind of, yeah, the more it's more the people, the relationships that you have with people, and not even the expectations from them. It's just being with nice people that are in that same frequency, that same vibe as you. So that's kind of something that I've challenged. I still, I mean, even though I'm coming across as someone who's, you know, talking, hopefully not smack, but something like learned, um, like I'm still struggling with this on a daily basis myself. And, and yeah, just trying to remove expectations um, from my life, whether that's money or, or elsewhere. Yeah, I love it. That, that, that quote is one that uh, I stumbled ac across it uh, years ago, and uh, I, I think I've whacked it up on my Insta page uh, a long time ago because I 100% I agree with that. It, it, it's the expectations that get in the way of enjoyment of anything. Hmm. So realistic, and and you're you're not expecting things that by by in putting expectations on anything, we're potentially setting ourselves up to fail. So. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, yeah, I, I love that share, mate. That's awesome. I, I now want to jump into the future because you're probably doing this already in terms of what I like to call living by design. Uh, can you paint us a picture of what your ideal lifestyle and your life vision looks like? Now, you, you, you might be doing that right here, right now, but I'd love for you to expand on it a bit if you can. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's I mean, it's a bit like what you said. I'm trying to live um, in the present and the, my ideal lifestyle. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really, really grateful. And this is what I've worked so hard for. I normally spend the mornings with my son, um, you know, up until about 12 o'clock. He's four years old. So we go um, he, little kickers, which is like a football thing, tennis, gymnastics, you know, so many different activities. And that's really like, for me, you know, these days, kids become teenagers probably by the time they're eight. So I was like, let me just like have the most valuable time with him while while he's young so that when he does go through those experiences he's like my dad was there he spent time with me he loves me and you know they'll always come around so like for me that's the uh, the most important thing in in my life and um the other thing is just always um being connected with my wife like you know we worked really hard to get to where we are it's been a, a joint effort um, not only practically, but we also used her serviceability a ton. Um, and she's just been such a support. So yeah, I just, I really just like to spend my days um, mostly in the morning with my son and then the rest of the day um, with my wife, you know, with a few hours sprinkled in, in the middle for, for work. That's, that's my lifestyle. We here, live here on the Gold Coast and never thought we would. Um, but yeah, next to the water and I just, I, I, I'm just counting my blessings. Love it. Is there, is there anything unfulfilled in, in that uh, lifestyle that you are still striving to achieve that you'd like to share? I think it's all it's all in the mind. 
I think it's all in the mind because um, once again, this I know this is a property podcast and I don't want to go too philosophical on you, um, Bushy, but, you know, some of the happiest people in the world are those who are not, have nothing at all. And, you know, some of the most unhappiest people in the world are, are those who have everything seemingly in the world. So for me, the uh, and I, I don't want to come across as a, a try hard saint or anything, but I'm, I'm literally just <laughs> trying, trying, trying. To, to go internal, to, to improve my mindset, um, to improve my heart set, if, if I can use that term, um, and, and really have a, a more organic, nourishing, fulfilling, and authentic view of the world, because obviously the world is a reflection of your own consciousness. If I can improve my own consciousness in the way that I try to tackle greed and the in the way that I try to help others in the way that I try to limit my own arrogance and try to lift other people up in, instead of myself then I know I'll be happier so I, I'm trying to do that <laughs> love it love it I, I worked in New Guinea many years ago where uh, PK and and there was a I, I was working way out in the remote coast the northeast coast of New Guinea and there was myself and a Kiwi we were doing a designing and building a wilderness safari lodge I'll never forget one of the locals and uh, one of the elders in that village where we were. He was a fisherman, and he he pulled me up one day and he said, "Now, my, I wasn't called Bushy, and I was Bushy Junior, but everyone knew me as John, which is my Christian name." And he said, "John, I don't understand you, white fellas. You spend all of your week busting your guts to do for maybe one, possibly two days a week, what I get to do every day of my <laughs> life." And it's like that that really stuck with me. I mean, and that was a long time ago when he said that. And I was like, you're absolutely right. And we uh, we've sort of got it all twisted around the wrong way. But um yeah. mate, if if I had a look, if you if you were to start out again, uh, would you invest in anything differently? Um such a good question. I mean, I I didn't it's not like I just picked the perfect path or anything at all. As cheesy as as this may sound, I think I would invest more in in connecting with people who have done what I wanted to do and put myself outside of my comfort zone to do that. And I, I don't mean like a, a property guru or, or a mentor that I pay $100,000 a year or anything like that, but rather just like an everyday person who's, you know, has a family, has achieved, maybe they're 40, 50, 60, whatever that is, they've achieved what I want to achieve, to like just pick their brains more. Because if I had done that, then I could have fast-tracked, I could have expedited some of the mistakes that I'd done. Or even if I didn't make huge mistakes, just, you know, like just optimize the way that I, I live life, you know, from a property perspective, but also otherwise. So, yeah, I think I would invest more and just making a concerted effort to be less shy and and just reach out to people who I admire and and strike conversations. Even if they just reject me, it's like, okay, we'll just go to the next person. I think, you know, people with experience can can teach us stuff that we can't learn in in any book or course or anything like that. Great, great suggestions there, mate. And that's something that everyone needs to take on. And what, what's the worst people someone someone's gonna say? No. Uh, exactly. It's not- it's not life ending, as you say. It's like dust yourself off. Let's just keep asking. No, absolutely. And there's so much wisdom in this world because we we live in a, a, a civilization now that almost turns our back on the elderly, hmm. uh, particularly in the in the Western world, which is very sad, I think, because the wealth of life wisdom that they carry with them that we are missing out on, and 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 almost if if you're too old, you're 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 past it. Whereas we 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 reversed that and thought, well, they've lived what we've done. Uh, we can shortcut this process and draw on their wisdom to avoid some of the mistakes that I'm probably about to make. What a better world it would be! So uh, again, I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent either, but I, I I'm, I'm continuously disappointed by the fact that we don't respect our elders enough and draw on their wisdom to help our own journey. So love that. Uh, There's probably a good segue here because I, I now want to sort of dive a bit deeper back into the property uh, subject. And I'd, given that you uh, help and talk to a lot of people uh, on the journey, I'd, I'd love for you to share what are some of the major mistakes that you see uh, investors making or, or potential investors making? Um, I think it comes back to that uh, whole concept of 10% of people actually think and 20% of people think they think. So 
like I've been very fortunate to have, you know, work with um, like thousands of investors now. And I consistently see that in their portfolios, because I have privy to their portfolios, I consistently see bad property purchases. You know, it might be hugely negatively geared, not anticipating rate rises. It might be just languishing in terms of growth. It might be in a mining town. It might be unnecessarily negatively geared to try save tax. And the thing is, it's not that they've like made these decisions themselves. It's these properties, these dud properties, for what have you, it's been made for them by property investment professionals. It's been made from for them by either like a, a, a course guru, which like myself, or like a buyer's agent or, um, you know, even people even worse than buyer's agents who are getting kickbacks from developers for, for selling you a brand new stock. And it all sounds great. And it's all about retiring in seven years with a depreciation and living off the equity. And it, that that's been, that was like genuinely my surprise. It's like these mistakes haven't been because they didn't know anything and they just bought in their backyard. It's not been because they listened to a friend, although that stuff exists, but it's like the mistakes are because they went with the wrong property professional. There's lots of good ones out there as well. Don't get me wrong. And you have plenty on your show, but I don't know if this is a fair statement, but in my experience, having looked at these thousands of portfolios, I literally know every buyer's agent and where they're buying at any time. Most of them, more than 50%, really don't know what they're doing. Mm, yeah, no, well, I'm going to come back to that in a minute uh, because I think it's uh, it's something that we really do need to dive into. But on the flip side of the mistakes then, uh, given... Uh, your own experience and and what you've seen in others uh, so far. What do you believe are the actual keys to successful investment and why? I think the key um, to to any successful investment is to know it inside out. So whether it's a, let's say a strategy, okay? So you've got a spectrum of very passive buy and hold. I'm just going to set and forget all the way on the other side of the spectrum to like active commercial developments or renovations or flipping or anything in the middle with rooming houses, DHA property, uh, you know, NDIS property, you know, like there's a million different strategies, regardless of what it is, you should know it inside out. Okay. And, and that's the secret to success. You should, if you even have a glimmer of doubt about a strategy or what to speak a suburb or what to speak of the property that you're going to buy in that suburb, then please, please, please don't be shy to either ask the professional who's selling it to you or get enough educated so you can make that that decision yourself. If you even have a glimmer of hope and set aside, you know, when you're, especially the first property, Bushy, there's so much like effort that's gone into it. You've bigged it up so much that by the end of it, you're like, even if it's not great, I just want to do it because I just want to be done with it, right? I just I just want to get have at least one under my belt and then I'll start taking things more seriously. Um, that's just the biggest mistake. Don't let your emotions get the better of you. If you need to say no to 20 properties before you get that 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 final one, say no to 20. Say no to if the buyer's agent is saying, mate, you know, Bushy, we've already presented you 20 properties, like you're taking the piss. I don't care. Like I'm not gonna buy it until I'm completely convinced. And it's the right one. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Being having the the guts to say no and and not allow your own impatience to get in the way of a good decision is absolutely spot on. Because the one thing that you and I know is that there is thousands of property opportunities out there, and and it's changing every day. So if you say no to one, that's not like there aren't going to be any more. So uh, I love that. Uh, you've touched on this a number of times during our conversation. That is the importance of a data led approach. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your own unique data-led uh, approach to property? Because I think, it uh, again, uh, there's data and then there's data. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people bury potential investors with data that doesn't make any difference, actually. In fact, it could take them in the wrong direction. Can you sort of expand on that a bit for us? Yeah, sure. So like the way that I've understood it for myself, at least, is that there is I mean, there's different layers, but to simplify it, there's macroeconomic data and then there's microeconomic data. Macroeconomic data, it's very hard to predict anything, right? You can say that inflation rises and therefore interest rates rise and property markets fall. That's kind of logical, but if you look at the history of property in Australia, there's no correlation between interest rates and, and property. 
um, what to speak of unemployment, you know, like um, there's so many instances of places with 10% unemployment doubling in the next five years. So when, when you take these, what the media talks about, these clickbaity things, it just confuses you. You're like a rag doll, you're just getting pushed around everywhere. So yeah. what I try to ex, uh, be an expert in is microeconomic data down to the LGA, what we call SA3 to use an ABS term, or ultimately suburb level. And this is where you can actually start drawing more concrete and conclusive inferences between historical and forward-looking data and predictive capital growth. For example, um, a really simple statistic like stock on market. Stock on market suggests that in a suburb, of all the properties, how many in terms of percentage are for sale? Now, of course, supply is the enemy of growth. We want supply to be low. Okay, so there's one thing that correlates with capital growth, but not by itself. And this is the mistake that people, they're like, okay, I know one or two stats. It's like, okay, now I can go find a place to invest in. You actually need to have enough checks and balances, 10, 20, 30 data factors, be clinical, be specific, be serious. And if all of them are pointing in the right direction, so some others are a days on market. You know, you don't need to pay for a course to just figure out what the days on market. If it's taking four months to sell a property, chances are like demand isn't strong, right? Chances are capital growth isn't about to occur. But if it had been taking four months and now it's taking two months and it's likely to take just one month, now you're onto something. Now you're onto a trend. Then you compare it to something like building approvals. Okay, stock on market is low. Supply is low. What about that future pipeline of building approvals in that suburb or around that, in that suburb? If that's huge, then the current growth that that suburb is experiencing is going to dissipate very quickly. But if there's no pipeline for any more developer activity, then that current pressure in the environment, in that market, that environment is going to last. So there's so many things you can, you can ascertain that with both uh, macro and micro, but really the, in my experience, the, to geek out for a second, the statistical correlation using a, a multi-linear methodology is more statistically reliable um, at a microeconomic level. 100% agree. And I, I, I mean, I, I guess I've been saying for some time now that uh, the, the thing we need to be very wary of uh, is sentiment because a lot of the sentiment now is media driven and the media focuses on the macro, which is designed to scare the hell out of us doing anything in actual fact, and ju but just to keep our eyeball glued to the, the nightly news. So there's some real danger in that perception thing. But if we come back to, and, and 100% agree, we would be diving into the micro level, which is happening on the local, local level, then we've got a much better chance of really understanding what's going and ignoring that noise because of the demand supply exercises are speaking very clearly through data that everyone can get their hands on, then why overcomplicate it or, or need to go much beyond that? Now, I love and you can that. also disprove things that are really interesting, Bushy. Like I, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just this came to my mind. It's like, you know, traditional folklore would suggest that if a area has high incomes and has always had high incomes, that that's where the most property price growth occurs in the future. It's very interesting that the actual opposite exists, that those areas that haven't had high growth, but are experiencing high growth in incomes now, I'm talking incomes, that is where price growth outperforms over the long term. So it's like, it's not the absolute level of data that matters, but rather trends. It, that is kind of where the secret source is. Ten, absolutely. It's changes that we're looking for, not what's Correct. happening here and now. And, that, and that's the danger, I think. I, I'd love your thoughts on this as well, but I get very frustrated with a lot of commentators who talk about property markets, which in my view don't exist because every property in every street and every area is different from the other. There's no apples for apples comparisons. And then there's a total reliance on median prices, which again, uh, don't tell a true story. Because if you've got a quality property in a quality location, the median price means nothing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what, what's your read of all about that? Yeah, I mean, you, I kind of hit the nail on, on the head. I, I'll just take an example of like where I live um, here. This is a place called Sorrento in, in the Gold Coast. And there are almost like three markets within this suburb. There are properties on the on the waterfront, on the canal, and then there are properties on like more the main road area. And then there are properties that aren't on the main road, but aren't on the canal either. And you found that even despite Gold Coast price, property prices dropping, property in general going down a lot in Australia, like let's be honest, 
these waterfront properties have actually gone up. Believe it or not, I'm not, not even lying, right? The main road properties have gone down 25%. 25% and the ones in the middle are somewhere in the middle. So it's like within the same suburb, you'd say, oh, PK, you're making stuff up. I, I can look up Bundle, I can look up Sorrento and I can tell you that the median has gone down, but it's like, hey, if I was to sell my house today, I'd get more than a year ago. Absolutely. And this is this is the the big miss, I think. And, and, and again, I think a lot of property players, because they focus on these uh, medium average levels and not focus on quality because quality always outperforms and as long as you know what quality is when it comes to property and then you you can create your own economy within property by just focusing on property regardless of what's happening with uh, market movements uh, if you're making sure that it's an investment grade property with owner occupier appeal so that you're making sure that you're appealing to the broad buyer market then those properties are always going to do well and and there's plenty of evidence of that i mean from the Sinking values perspective, I've been expecting it because, you know, again, I'm a bit old and crusty, PK, but uh, every time we see a rapid rise, particularly on a broad scale like we did post-COVID, then it's it's normal for prices to soften. Yeah. But the, the, the really challenging part now, particularly for investors who got excited about around the FOMO and the hoo-ha that was talked about property in the good times uh, 12 months ago, is that unless they're focusing on that uh, really – a-grade quality property uh, that, that's had the, the data-led uh, growth drivers that are supporting it, a lot of lot of property in a lot of areas are going to go down and then flatline for an ex- yeah. extensive period yeah. of time. So that that quality focus is, is more important now than it's ever been, although it's always been important, I believe. Uh, I'd love now to shift into, because you've, you've developed your uh, property investment accelerator course, Talk to us a bit more, more about what that's about, why you created it, what are some of the key messages that come out of it and who's best suited to uh, take advantage of that? Yeah, sure. And and I'd probably preface this with saying that um, before considering any course, like people need to be utilizing the free education available to them through diverse um, mediums and, and diverse people that put content out there. Like that's the first thing. Not everyone needs a course. Um but in terms of the property investment accelerator course, I saw that there was really nothing in the market that was a completely independent that didn't have any upsell. Oh, you got you want coaching? That's an extra three thousand. You want the tools? That's an extra two thousand. Oh, by the way, here's a house and land package I prepared. Like just just education for education's sake. There was nothing in Australia like that uh, without some sort of um, you know conflict of interest or innuendo. Um, The people that it's for, I mean, I can just tell you who my typical client is. They're sort of in mostly Sydney or Melbourne. Um, They are kind of priced out, right? So they're like, okay, uh, we do want to become property investors, but do we really want to pay $800,000 for somewhere past Penrith that's going to be 3%, 4% yield? No. Um, So they want to be interstate. When it comes to interstate, they're like, okay, I kind of know Sydney and kind of know Melbourne because I've lived there for a number of years, but... I don't know, Perth, I don't know, Brisbane, I don't know, Adelaide, I don't know, regional Australia at all. Um, And I don't want someone telling me where to invest. (laughs) Like that is like critical. My clients do not want me to say, by the way, don't ask questions. Here's the contract. Trust me, sign on the dotted line. That is not what they want. Rather, they're the 10% of people. They actually are thinkers. They want to learn how to think. They want to make their own conclusions the right strategy, you know, for them, the right suburb, the right property, how to negotiate, how to get it perhaps a little bit under market value, sharp price, how to do all of that without catching a flight, you know, through local property managers, you know, people on your team that are working for you, not against you for free, you know, that's, that's really important. And they want to do this sustainably. They want to build a skill and have a mentor at the ready on demand so that they can rinse and repeat. Cause none of my clients are like, yeah, I'd be happy with one property. No, they're ambitious. Like they want to, it's not like they want to buy a Lamborghini, but like they just want to build a portfolio so they can, effectively just get a comfortable living, right? Like just transition from active income to passive income. That's kind of it in a nutshell. I mean, I can go into the tools and the methodology and the videos and the community, but at the end of the day, like it gets the job done and that's who it gets the job done for. Well, you're 
rather than giving someone a fish, you're teaching someone how to fish so they exactly. can feed themselves forever, which is which is which is perfect. And I, I guess a sort of leveraging off that uh, in in the context of what we've been talking about today, what, what what is in your opinion the best way for DIY investors to develop their own strategy, buy into state. Uh, buy good value properties and be able to negotiate a property purchase. Can you talk us through that and perhaps give us an example of it? Sure. i give you like a, a really, I always use this example. So if people probably heard this one before, if they follow me, but um, I had this uh, client in 2000 and I think 19 or 20, his name's Bennett. He was a new migrant into Australia, literally only been here two years, lived in Melbourne and he wanted to naturally do all of the above mentioned things. Um, so using the, the tools and the methodology that we provide, he built his own strategy. Now, his strategy is different from my strategy, different your strategy, different incomes, different serviceability, risk profile. He didn't want to be active. I'm happy to be active. He didn't want to be active. He wanted completely passive. So he built his own strategy. And, and the thing is, Bushy, that it's not like he just put, put down a few bullet points on a piece of paper. That's my strategy. Like He actually used the financial models that we provide and built out a cohesive strategy, okay, number of properties, the frequency, this is the serviceability, this is how I can do it. It's not like just arbitrary 10 properties in 10 years. He worked with an accountant and mortgage broker to do that, and he was confident this is the foundation. He identified a suburb called Pacific Pines in the Gold Coast using the data methodology that we that we teach, and we give all the data. It's not my data, but we teach them how to use it. Um and Pacific Pines in, in 2020, this is in the Gold Coast. Um, and so he selected the, the suburb completely remotely, confidence in the data. Then he uh, used data plus local property managers that we gave him to find the right pockets, the right street in Pacific Pines. And he's just built a relationship. Now, he has an accent. like He's not like a true blue Aussie or anything like that. He has an accent, but he kind of overcame that shyness and just, you know, over a course of three weeks, every Monday, 10 minutes, he built a relationship with a few agents. And one time this agent called him on a Wednesday and she said, look, there's this um, couple who live in this property. They want to, um, they want to sell it because they're having some issues domestically. They don't want it to be public. It's kind of embarrassing for them. This property is yours if you want it. Right. And of course, off market deals are always a little bit smelly. They're, they're too good to be true. What, what's up with it? But this had just happened to be one of those deals where he got the property manager and nothing was wrong with it. Stacked up from a data perspective, he did his valuation, and because they were in a they were motivated sellers, he got it at a sharp price. It was valued at high five hundreds. He got it for mid five hundreds, awesome. um, and then and that thing has gone up. I mean, everyone knows you know how much it's gone up in Gold Coast. It's like worth eight hundred something now, um, and like what what really what I'm really proud of is that this was a guy Bennett. Um, that knew nothing about property before, but he was willing to go outside his comfort zone. He was willing to pick up the phone. He was willing to trust data and, and he back tested it to make sure that it was it was legit. He was willing to lean on the team around him, like conveyances, like building and pest inspector. I mean, he didn't catch a flight up to up to the Gold Coast. He was, you know, the building and pest inspector, the property manager did all the due diligence for him. And like it's just happy days <laughs> since then. So like that, that's kind of what we do. And I think I should also make this point that anyone can do this. Like you don't actually need to do my course. You definitely don't need a buyer's agent, but anyone can do this. If you have the wherewithal with data, you can pick up the phone, talk to local um, property managers. You can buy anywhere around Australia, high growth, high yield properties. Um, but to take your analogy, just one step further, the fishing, um, I find that some people, you give them all the tools, all the knowledge, they have that fishing rod, they've hooked the fish and they're reeling it in, but it's just like a really big fish. Sometimes they just need an extra pair of hands like on that fishing rod to just to help you know, pull it in. And that helps them with the confidence, just that extra assurance that they're doing the right thing. And then would you just kind of get that fish over, over on top of like the platform that you're on, the jetty or whatever, then you can let go of the, the fishing rod and they're like, I did this myself. And that's a really cool feeling. Love it, love it. Uh, we uh, we've touched on this subject a little bit, and 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 what I like love about what you've just shared, uh, it, it's definitely important to have good independent professionals who don't have a vested interest, like the property manager, like the building inspector, like a good mortgage broker who can help you with capacity, uh, like a good accountant who can and help you with entities and all the rest of it. The the uh, 
the outlier here to some degree that we've spoken about a little bit is the buyer's agents. Talk to us about uh, your thoughts on buyer's agents in a bit more detail and, and other property pr- professionals as far as uh, an investor's needs are concerned. Sure. And once again, I'll preface this, but I have nothing against buyer's agents. And actually, um, I think we've produced more than 75 buyer's agents through the course as well. People who didn't want to be buyer's agents, but just fell in love with property, became buyer's agents. So I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for good buyer's agents. But like I said before, I feel that most aren't good. And even if they aren't, are good, they're a bit like gardeners. So let, let's take that analogy. You know, if, if you have a garden, we've talked gardening before, before we hit record and I was spending the morning doing gardening, you know, to, to do gardening, you do need to put in some time, right? The best fertilizer is the gardener's shadow. So you need to put in a bit of time and you also need the right tools, right? You need like the, the whipper snipper, you need the lawnmower, you know, some gloves, some, some tools and stuff. Now, the, the thing that people kind of get into this trap of is thinking, I don't have the tools and I don't have the time. The reality is that you might think doing gardening takes a lot of time, but if you have a bit of knowledge, you can expedite it. Okay. So you don't need to take trial and error and plant the wrong flower only to realize that you planted it in the wrong season or in the wrong location. You can just go on YouTube. Not that I'm saying properties like this exactly, but you can go on YouTube and say when to plant this flower. Okay. Where, how much shade does it need? How much sun? Just with a bit of knowledge, you don't have to do the trial and error. You can get it perfect every time. And with the tools, I mean, we're not living in the 60s. We're not living in the 70s. This is 2023. All the data is online. People will tell you they have their proprietary data, that their data is somehow magical. Guys, it all ultimately comes from domain, core logic, and ABS. Like, let's let's be honest. Okay, you can package it up and, you know, pivot it in whatever way you want, but it all comes from the same providers. And it costs them millions of dollars to maintain. So no one else is doing that as a private enterprise. Um, so the data, go down to Bunnings, get your tools. All right, just hop on those websites, get the tools. Same analogy. And in terms of time, all right, property investors who know what they're doing through education take about three to five hours a week over one or two months to buy a property. Now, if you don't have that, like if you don't have five hours a week, three to five over a couple of months, sure, pick up the phone, get Jim's mowing or get a gardener to come out and help you. But if you do have that time, you can do it yourself. And the thing is that, Buyers agents, the, the argument, right, is that they're professionals. Bushy, would you um, do a kidney transplant by yourself or would you get a, a surgeon to do that? Would you get a root canal done yourself or would you get a dentist to, to do 100% of people go to the dentist, 100% of people go to surgeons, more than 95% of people don't use a buyer's agent. So yes, they're professionals, but a different type of professional a more discretionary, nice to have professional, not a professional in the sense that to change in the wiring in this house, I'm definitely going to use an electrician. They're not electricians. They're not dentists. They're not surgeons. All right. They're gardeners. Gardeners are also professionals, guys. Let's not disc gardeners. They're respectable people, but they're not necessary. And that's my, that's my philosophy. They're not necessary. The reason people use them more often than not is because all the content in Australia is consumed or or like dominated by buyers agents they tell you if they if you don't use them you're going to make mistakes and i just i'm not a big fan of that fear mongering i've in my experience genuinely found that with the right tools with a dollop of education and just with that right amount of time you can do it yourself yeah 100 percent agree and and I, I, I mean i'm advocate of buyers agents for the right purpose and and the right one and it's like anything if you're going to use a professional, use a good professional because there's some pretty average professionals out there. And unfortunately, the buyer's agency industry, because of the way they get paid, there's a, a subconscious pressure for them to get you to buy a property quickly because if you don't, then they don't get paid. So I think there's some structural issues actually with the whole buyer's agency framework that gets in the way of of uh, good situations. And and certainly, if if you don't have time and you, you aren't able to invest in your own knowledge, do do the due diligence to make sure you get a good buyer's agent. But if you're going to be serious about treating your portfolio as a business, which which we both touched on, then you need to invest in your knowledge. And once you've invested in that knowledge, and you don't need that person to do the running around because you can do it yourself. Now, I, I, I love your thoughts on that. 
Mate, um, I, I want to shift now into a bit of a your read of what you're seeing with property conditions at the moment, and because uh, there's a lot of lot of talk in in various uh, forums at the moment. You know, should I buy now or wait? And what and where are the best opportunities? Can you give us your your read of read of that? And I'll preface this by yeah. saying we're not giving any advice here, sure. uh, because <laughs> everyone's situation is different and everyone's needs are different. But but I'd, I'd love you to sort of balance the equation because there's still a lot of fear out there in the marketplace, mm. and uh, you know a bit of a if we use a a, a bushy buffetism. Uh, it's times like these that often the best opportunities arise because everyone's scared and paralysed and sitting like a rabbit in front of a, the spotlights. What What's your read of the current scenario? Um, so I think people like me who have something to sell always say it's a good time to buy, right? We're incentiv- incentivized to say that. Um, I like to think about it in a more nuanced way. I think there's always locations in Australia that are worth not buying in and that there are always locations in Australia that are worth buying and there's buying windows you're either in it or you're not it's quite simple so i think yeah. the the whole property landscape like you alluded to earlier bushy like very accurately we've just had like record price growth that's unsustainable it doesn't happen forever the average boom in australia if you look at 70 years of history goes for about 2 to 4 years we yeah. started at the end of 2020 kind it was still growing like like last year let's be honest so it kind yeah. of went for a, about 2 years so you know just two and a half years then there has to be a dip. There has to be some sort of correction. That's perfectly normal. Nothing to freak out about. Yeah. At the same time, that is the macro Australian property markets trajectory. Within the micro, if you talked about a property boom at the start of 2021 in Sydney, people in Perth would have been like, what like what boom? Like, where were you guys talking about? There's no boom over here, right? So the whole yep. point is that there's different cycles for every market. Every city, every suburb has its own cycle. And so the whole point is that yes, we should be afraid of investing if we don't know what we're doing. If you are, are just following someone blindly, or if you're like, you know, your friends made money in the boom and over the last two years, you're like, ah, FOMO, I've missed out. I'm just going to buy anything. Please don't do that. Please keep your money in your own pocket. But if you actually know what you're doing, it's always a good time to buy. And I've, I've all very open about the areas that we're buying in, like pockets of Townsville, pockets of Perth, especially North Perth. You know, it's it's really, really attractive. And two, one really cool point that you made earlier um, around markets within markets, within a suburb, the medians can be misleading. You need to buy, especially in these times, properties that will last the, the test of time, that you know, the own occupier appeal will always be there. You don't need to be a waterfront property. You know, even if it's a 400K suburb, buy in the best area within that 400K suburb because the locals, the demographic that loves that suburb, you know, they're going to love the best suburb, the best pockets of that suburb all the time. The bottom areas or the worst areas in the suburb, those are the ones that tank. So, yeah, I mean, there's still opportunities in, in parts of um, South Australia. In fact, North Adelaide, not that... I'm a big fan of Elizabeth or surrounds by any stretch of the imagination, Um, but that's still growing and you wouldn't know it if you had just been media, Sydney, Melbourne centric in your um, consumption of of content. So look, I I don't think there's anything to freak out about. I'm a big believer of timing the market and time in the market. Both, I think both are important. So to try to catch a falling knife in Sydney, you know, may not be the the best strategy, but even in Sydney, there's areas that aren't really falling right now. So yeah, it behooves everyone to get some education and and ask ourselves to ourselves better questions than is it a good time to buy right now, but rather where and how. Yeah, and what exactly? And what? Right. Yeah, a combination of all of those. Yeah, I love that. That's a that's a that's a, a great response. Thanks, mate. Because it's it's uh, if you think borderless. And and because every area is going through uh, different elements of the cycle and they're all out of sync with each other generally, uh, then there's a world of opportunity out there because, it, as you know, there's over 15,000 different suburbs and nearly 11 million properties in the country. So if you know where to look and you know what you're looking for uh, within the confines of what your capacity is and, and most importantly, your affordability. Uh, mm. you know, one of the elements that I'd say a lot of uh, investors ignore or, or put very cursory input into is what's the actual cash flow affordability this probably going to be when every cost involved in buying and holding its concern. 
uh, you know, I'd, I'm sure you do this, but I'd, some of the work that we do when we're helping investors, we we actually get right down to tin tax to work out how much per week in year one, three, five, 10, 15 beyond this property is actually going to cost or put in your pocket so that there's no secrets or surprises and they're, they're comfortable that it is going to be affordable to hold. Because if you're holding a property for 10, 15 or more years, and your life changes to the point where suddenly you can't afford it and you have to fire sale a property, you've just you've just shipwrecked your whole strategy. So uh, so all of those elements are important. Mate, uh, we could talk about this for, for hours and uh, we will at, at a later point. I, I'm, I'm pretty keen to keep the conversation going because the more I talk to you, the more I know we're on the same page in relation to uh, you know the, the quality information that people need to hear. But mate, I'm going to jump into what I affectionately refer to as the bushfire lightning round or the ambush round, which are the old yep. uh, podcast fast four questions that you always get with a cigarette and a blindfold to answer. <laughs> yep. and, the, and, the, and the time starts now. So uh, you mentioned a couple already, but what's your favorite quote and why? I think it's um, happiness unshared can scarcely be called happiness. Um, and I think that is by Charlotte Bronte, if if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I, I, I completely a- agree with it. The why, is, I've experienced it. Yeah, happiness in a own a mansion by yourself who wants to live that you, you need people to share um, your happiness with. Love it. Love it. So that's a, a gr- I haven't actually heard that one. So that, that is a cracker. Uh, shifting into a literary field for a minute, what's the top book that you'd recommend we read and why? The top book um, is, there's so many books. Uh, recently, I read uh, this one by uh, Jay Shetty. It's He's actually a friend of mine from many, many years ago. We went to a, a monastery together. That's another story. Um, oh. But it's Think Like a Monk. Think Like a Monk. So um, the reason for that is he, he talks about how we in our mind, we should think like an entrepreneur, but in our heart, we should act like a saint, like Mother Teresa or something like that. So this kind of confluence of two worlds is really interesting to me. Love it. Love it. That's that's brilliant. I haven't read that one either, so I'm going to make sure I do. Uh, Switching back into the investment sphere for a minute, what's both the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received today? Um, The best piece of investment advice is is buy property. I'll keep it simple. Um, (laughs) I followed it. It worked. Uh, and, And the worst piece of investment advice is buy property. (laughs) <laughs> two-edged sword exactly right it's, uh, it's like you know yeah that, that that's my answer i won't elaborate further <laughs> no i know i think in the context of everything we talked about that that's pretty self-evident what that what that means so uh th- thanks for bringing that back into our foresight mate uh, final question uh what's a personal happy habit rewarding ritual or daily discipline that you employ that you think's contributed most to your investment success today um, I meditate every day in the morning. Um, I try to do it for 90 minutes, if not longer. Uh, it's, it's not perfect. <laughs> Mine goes crazy. Um, but meditation, I've been doing that since I was, um, like in high school, um, and more, more seriously since university and it's changed my life. I think meditation gets all the credit to any small things that I've achieved. Love it. That, that sort of, Self reflection without without reflecting to some degree, uh, it's amazing what comes out of that. Just exercise. being non judgmental, just not not uh, not beating yourself up, not beating others up, just observing your thoughts for what they are. Love it, love it, but uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, doing more of this. But um, if we were to summarize, summarize our conversation today what are the key takeaways uh, that investors should take away from what we've talked about i think from a finance or wealth perspective no one cares about your money as much as you do your future as much as you do and you know really the best investment the best real estate that you can invest in is the six inches between your two ears i really 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 firmly believe that um, you know, being that top 10, 10%, the people who actually think have the right team around you, but question everything, question them, question yourself, enjoy the journey. It's not about financial independence. You know, it's like, said, it was never about financial independence. That's not financial happiness is not the goal of life. It helps, but it's not the goal of life. And um, what else did we talk about? I think, you know, the process of buying data, like, 
I kind of trip myself up because on one hand I espouse all these spiritual things, but at, at the end of the day, you know, to, where the, the rubber hits the road, it's all about data. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are, how great your marketing um, budget is. Data is cold, objective, hard fact. And that is what makes you rich, not anything else. Love it. Love that. It removes our, uh, our perceptions and our uh, our own judgments that we apply to things and if it's cold hard facts and you're looking at them over time so you can read that read the trends that's that's where the magic sits love that uh might um in sort of bring it to a close what's what's new and next for you um i mean like i kind of gave that piece of advice to myself when i was uh, younger i'm actually looking to just connect with more amazing people um like you know, genuinely speaking like sincerely like you bushy um, you know, there's so many investors in Australia and just not investors as well that um, are just, they have stories to tell and we can learn from their stories and they're remarkable, inspirational people. So I think this next chapter of my life is just connecting with as many people as I can to, um, yeah, to, to absorb that knowledge. I love it. I love it. Uh, for those that have really resonated with your message today, then PK, uh, how can they find out more or get more involved with you? Sure. The brand is Australian Property Mastery with PK. There's a YouTube channel, um, you know, 20,000 subscribers. There's a podcast, there's a Facebook community. It's a group of 30,000 people, um, all the other socials. Yeah. Just, just get in, just get stuck with that in, stuck into that free education. And then we can talk about the course at some other time. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I, I love it. If you, uh, the, the, the challenge for a lot of investors is, is in immersing themselves in a safe environment where they can openly ask questions and learn without having something shoved down their throat. Yeah. It's very few of those, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I love what you're doing in that space uh, and creating that sort of collaborative uh, co-learning community yeah, where, you, where you can share equally and, and pick things up as you go. So I look, uh, PK, I really... Uh, Appreciate your very generous time today. Uh, I am uh, seriously looking forward to continuing the conversation and uh, appreciate you joining us to share your worth of wisdom. I'm very grateful. It was my honour. Thank you so much, Bushy. Thanks, PK.